And now your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to It's a Miracle. The stories you're about to see all have one thing in common, the unexpected. And even after you've seen them, you'll still be scratching your head wondering, how could that possibly have happened? Well, that's the beauty of a miracle. It defies explanation. And our first story also defies the laws of probability. If you've ever been wronged and wished for swift justice, you're going to love this one. Life in Verona, Mississippi is quiet, safe, and relatively peaceful. But on May 15, 2001, all that was about to change. It began as Jim and Colette Stanley left to celebrate their daughter Rebecca's birthday. The morning started off really nice, and Becca was so excited because she got to pick where we ate for her birthday. And um, since it was a family affair, Jamie left his car at home, and we all jumped in the car, and everybody was excited about going out to eat. It's not often that we're all together, so this was one of those days when we were all going to be together. As the Stanley family happily headed out from home, someone else was breaking in. We stopped and had lunch, and then from there, they took me on to work. I work for American Family Radio, and what I do there is I'm a member of the on-air staff. I get to play the music, share stuff, give stuff away every now and then, so, you know, I have one of the greatest jobs in the world. Coming up on 29 and a half past the hour, you're tuned to American Family Radio. There are so many choices you can make, but you've chosen to be with us, and I thank you. After we dropped Jim off, I turned the radio on to Jim's show. We headed home, and I was thinking about what we had to do. We're going to run home for just a second, and then Becca will go and see about the play. By the time Colette and her children arrived home, they'd only been away two hours. But in that short time, a lot had happened. When we pulled up in the driveway, we saw that Jamie's car door was open. So as soon as I stopped, Jamie jumps out, because, you know, that's his car. Oh, look at this. It was trashed, and the CD player was ripped out, and the cords were hanging everywhere. Look at the car. Everything's trashed. I mean, I was just so shocked. I just bought the CD player. Oh, no. As soon as Jamie told me that the car was broke into, I went into the house to call the police. That's when I realized the car wasn't the only thing that had been broke into. Colette could barely believe what she was seeing. Her home had been ransacked. You could hardly walk through the room because of all the stuff that was all over the floor. It was just unreal what they had done. Mom, Mom, come look. Oh, no. Look at this. Everything was everywhere. My hockey equipment was all over the floor. Sheets, clothes, posters ripped off the wall. Jamie, I'm so sorry. I felt very mad that whoever had done this, you know, you just want for them to pay, I guess you could say. Mom! Mom! Rebecca soon discovered that her room had also not been spared. My jewelry box was open, my drawers were open, and stuff had been pulled down from my closet. When I looked at what had happened, I was sad and scared. It was just not something I wanted to see on my birthday. 
that's when I went into my room, and then I looked and, and saw that my jewelry was gone. My grandmother's ring is gone. And I think that was the first thing that made me think of how horrible this was. I know there were things there that might have been worth a little more, but to me, that was the one that was worth the most, was that ring. My grandmother's ring is gone. And um, I just sat down on the bed and started crying. In her shock and confusion, Colette had forgotten to call 911. And when she finally did, she was in for another scare. And I got a lady on the phone, and I told her our house has been burglarized. No, we've been through the house. And she said, did you look in the closets? And I said, no, we didn't look in the closets. She said, well, you need to get out of the house. They could still be in there. Becca, Becca, get out of the house. We've got to go right now. Let's just get out of the house. What do you mean, get out of the house? I'm sorry, guys. No Once Colette and her children were safely outside, she took a moment to call Jim before the police arrived. AFR, this is Jim. I got a phone call from Colette, and she was just sobbing. I need you to come home now. Calm down. There was terror in her voice. It's OK. Calm down. I'll find a way. I felt okay. the urgency, but also I said, you know, honey, you dropped me off. How am I going to get home? So I went into engineering, and I asked them if I could borrow a van. And they said, sure. When I left work, my primary concern was getting home as quickly as I could. As Jim left the radio station, Verona police officer Jim Levine arrived at the Stanley home. When I arrived on the scene, they were very shook up. They couldn't believe that somebody just broke into their house. Car is trashed, the CD player ripped out, dash ripped out. I mean, the whole house is trashed. The whole Our main concern was to make sure the house was secure, that the perpetrators were not inside the house. When we entered the house, we drew our weapons and we proceeded with caution. Clear. We didn't know if they might have hidden in the closets or under the bed if they were still in the residence. We walked through it carefully, checked each bedroom and closet and under each bed. Clear. And did not find anybody. With the residence secure, Officer Levine began writing his report. By this time, Jim was only a short distance away. I was cutting across the back way because there's not a lot of traffic. I wasn't worried about anything that had been taken. The only thing I was worried about, you know, was getting there to them. But what Jim saw next stopped him dead in his tracks. Maybe a mile from the house, I see these two boys coming up the road, and one of them was carrying a really large bag and I realized it was Jamie's hockey bag. I saw these two kids with stuff that belonged to us, and I said, that's not right. And so I pulled over and I asked them if they needed a ride. Give you fellas a ride? Mm. They were sweating, and they were obviously tired because they had walked about a mile with this stuff. Sure, that'd be great. OK, hop in. The community we live in, folks still help folks. So the boys were relaxed. They were relieved to be in out of the heat. I didn't know whether the kids were armed or not, but I had the security that they didn't know who I was, and they didn't know where we were going. Where are you fellas headed? Going home. And so I asked them, I said, where do you live? And they told me where they lived. All right, well, I've got to run an errand, and then I'll take y'all on to the house. All right, that's cool. Well, they didn't know that the errand I had to run was to get them to the police. The road to the police station would take Jim near his home. There's a curve in our road that you have to slow down for. So the boys didn't think anything about me slowing down at that point. And the trip to the authorities suddenly became much shorter. All right, you boys, don't try and run now. And 
they were just stunned. There was no resistance, but there was just a look of devastation that came over them, you know, just utter defeat. What? What's wrong? Get the officer. Get the officer. And so the officer comes out, and he Get says what's officer. going on. I think I've got the guys that robbed the house. Then I felt a great sense of relief. Keep your hands up where I can see them. Get your hands up. Because I knew that I didn't have to worry about them getting away anymore. Where'd you get this stuff at? The police officers immediately took charge of the situation. He started going through their pockets, and he says, does any of this stuff look like yours? And everything in their pockets, except just a couple of things, were ours. Look like it belongs to you? Yes, yeah, sir. That's our stuff. That's Jamie's stereo. They laid all the stuff out on the car. It's my grandmother's ring. It's my grandmother's ring. I'm glad you got it back, baby. That's I just thought, you know, thank you, God. I got the ring back. And it was just so wonderful to look and see we had it all back. Come on, guys. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, you're the man, Jim. You're the man. <laughs> Jim took a big risk by picking up these boys. A lot of juveniles today carry guns and knives. And it took a lot of courage. 12 years that I've been patrolling the streets, never had anything like this happen. I could tell by the look in their eyes. They just, it happened so fast, they didn't know what hit them. <laughs> As the stunned burglars were escorted to the police station, Officer Levine made another chilling discovery. Do these belong to y'all? <laughs> yeah, they do. We've been missing those. Still kind of frozen, too. It was funny to see that the popsicles were still cold and that the popsicles were one of their items that they had stolen. After the trying events of the day, the Stanleys were grateful to laugh again, and especially grateful that everything had worked out for the best. I don't believe in luck as much as I believe in God and what God can do. And I truly feel that God had a hand in this. We left the house at 12.30. We took Jim to work, we got home at 2.30. The police were there before 3 o'clock, and the kids were arrested probably before 3.30. That, to me, was a miracle, you know? People don't, things don't happen that quick. <laughs> I realized how fortunate we were to catch the kids because out of everything else that their parents didn't teach them, they also didn't teach them not to take rides with strangers. I think that God had his hand on this so much and so well that he protected Jim. What did they do them? I don't know what I would have done if something had happened to him. I just praise God that nothing did. Mm -hmm.